I, uh, yeah, I'm a mining engineer. I probably don't look like one, but I'm a mining <laughs> engineer and I, I worked in operations. I worked with EPC. Uh, I did mining contracting too. I don't know why, but I did that. And I, uh, and I uh, worked for Accenture before now working for EY. What I like about this presentation, though, all the series we'll be having is that, you know, we're not trying to sell anything. It's really about thinking for, for all of us and trying to get the discussion going on innovation. There's something specific about innovation that I like, and uh, it's the fact that I did an MBA that was focused on strategy and innovation at the University of Oxford. So I actually studied innovation. And uh, there's a lot of uh, research centers we have in Oxford around innovation. And people like Jeff Bezos are very involved every year. They, you know, there's lots of private equity stuff that goes from innovation. And the, 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 the extra for, for that type of innovation is that it's focused on social entrepreneurship. So it's really, it's something that's related to mining. It's really, are we making the planet better? That's the question that you know, they try to answer. Now, Are we gonna talk about that? Diapers raising? yes, yes. So <laughs> here's, what's, here's what I think about innovation. Number one, it's really hard. If it was so simple, everybody was doing it. Number two, it's very, very painful. Um, it costs money. It's never perfect because you gotta keep, you know, increasing it. So many people run away from it, especially engineers and accountants. Um, <laughs> I don't know why I went from engineering to accounting firm, but it's, it's the same guess. Okay, yeah. So, so I decided to do an experiment. I was telling uh, Nathan that I, uh, I don't know why I like to put myself in trouble, but that's also part of innovation. So yesterday I decided that I know the content of my presentations. That's not what I'm worried about. I decided that, okay, if I'm going to talk about innovation, really, how can I show that I really believe in it? So I decided not to do it in PowerPoint. That's the first thing that came to mind. I said, oh, maybe, you know, why am I doing it in PowerPoint? Oh, I'm going to try to <laughs> <laughs> look for something else. Then I Google, you know, all the alternative PowerPoint, and there are many, and I sell on Prezi just because there's too many people that think it's good. So then I, you know, then I, I learned it last night, okay? So that's how fast my innovation thing goes. I learned how to run last night. I went to bed late, but I learned how to run last night. and. Um, and like I said, cost money. So there's the free version, which is very basic and it's public. And there's the, there's the pro version that costs money for one month free, whatever, which is basically open innovation piece is the one month. It's like I'm opening my eyes and then the rest, I gotta pay. What's it called, Prezi? Prezi, <laughs> with a Z, like okay. president, but with a Z. Okay. So that's the story of innovation. It's not simple. Uh, you have to get out of your way to do it. I'm not gonna lie to you. This is not going to be your perfect presentation. <laughs> but if you bring me back in a year, after my membership expires, <laughs> I'll probably be better at it. And that's what innovation is about. You don't have the solution. You try stuff, and then you keep perfecting it. And I'll talk about these in, in detail. So please understand that this is not going to be perfect. But it's my way of testing innovation for myself. So yeah, this is crazy and it's very fascinating. So we'll talk about what is innovation, then we'll talk about diapers, razors, and gold ingots. What's the link between that and how can we make a link between that? Really, it's not that different. It's all mass production. Um, then we'll talk about rockets, credit cards, and mines. You know, what's the link? And then we'll, uh, then we'll talk, okay, how do we go from here? It's, you know, uh, you already, Mark has already talked about open innovation, that's one way to do it, and there's other ways. So, what is innovation anyway? Um, you Google open innovation, 2013 was 450. I Google just innovation, it's 407 million in 0.3 seconds. <laughs> so, people get different definitions of what it is. I'm sure some of them recruit, but it's a complicated situation, innovation. The easiest way for me to talk about innovation is really to go back to, you know, the basics. Uh, I don't know if you can see that, so let me see. Everything on this planet has fundamentals, and we gotta go from the fundamentals. It's just, you know, things just don't fly. There's rules to the game. 
Um, there is what, this is what they call the S curve. It's how we do things as humans in innovation. Uh, we start slow, and when we start at the, at the beginning, really there's a lot of people with many ideas and nobody knows what the dominant design is gonna be. Um, simple, think about Blu-ray and DVDs. You know, in the beginning, nobody knows what it's going to be. Everybody's doing something, and then two guys show up that look like they know what they're doing. Then everybody says, okay, that's the dominant design. And then uh, one wins because they have network externality. So they create a structure that makes it impossible for other people to go the other way. Uh, think about Microsoft. You know, think about Apple. Think about uh, railway. If you try to create a new railway today and beat CN and CP, you're going to have to suffer because they have network externality. doesn't mean you can't do it. Maybe your real has to be different. That's when you have the disruption here and you come up with a new way of doing things. And that's the key for mining guys to think about innovation. Is like, okay, here's everything. Everything you learn at school is here. Everything you learn when you join is here. If you want to disrupt it, you got to go against the paradigm. That's one thing. Totally is not going to be simple, <laughs> but we get there. Here's the second thing. Uh, to go back to the blues and the yellows and the reds and whatever color we're talking about, an innovator or somebody that really drives innovation is really not different from the human being they are. So if I pull up a new device for making your Let's say you put the business card together and sh you know shred it and put it all to the cloud right now here. How many of us are going to just start doing it? Not many. I'm actually, believe it or not, even if I'm an engineer, I'm actually an early adopter of anything. <laughs> if somebody tells me there's, oh, you know, oh, there's this thing that you can use and then it can transport you from your office to your house in five seconds, I'm like, oh, where is that? Then I'll test it. This is... You know, they used to call them the crazies, but these are the people that line up at Best Buy or whatever <laughs> at night to get the first product. There's not a lot of us doing that. And in mining, I think we both, if there was a section here, we'll be over there. Because we ended up when nobody actually cares about it anymore. <laughs> so that's, that's, when we talk about innovation, um, please don't do it at McEwen, uh, but you go back to your company, Look at your CEO, look at his Blackberry, look at what he's wearing, and try to see what the other people are doing and see how far he is from that. That tells you a lot about whether or not he's gonna drive innovation. Because the human being is still the same. The job is just a part of life. It's not really, it doesn't change the person. And then, here's where I think we, we fail in mining in general. We confuse the innovation in everything. What Marcus and his group are doing is really the disruptive one. It's really, you know, oh yeah, why, don't we, why are we using water? That's disruptive. Most mining companies are comfortable in continuous co improvement, which is actually how they call it, the, the groups. You know, yeah, let's just, oh yeah, we're doing, you know, two loops in the pit, let's now do one. Yeah, that's good. It's not a question about why are we doing loops anyway? But that's, that's, that's the question. So that's disruptive. Most people don't like doing disruptive stuff. Uh, great people try to do, you know, especially people that understand human nature. You try to be in, at the border. You say, okay, yeah, I'm going to move you a little bit until you suddenly discover yourself disruptive. But that's where if you like disruptive stuff, you have to design a project that looks like this, but will slowly get them out. <laughs> it's that simple. If you think about um, other companies I, I did work for before, BHP Billiton and the and uh, OneSub program, which is basically all the procedures are all in the computer. They want to do something, everything centralized, standardized. They didn't start with that. They started by making sure all the procedures are the same. They started by telling people that they have to have the same look of offices around the world. So you got to start something that looks like nothing and you slowly get them out. So that's, that's basically fundamentals for, for innovation. And you guys know this guy, that's Kuti Um He's talking about R&D type innovation. 
that's something else. It's it's a line in your in basically in your in your statement, so it's kind of complicated. But you know, we know last year there was a report about it. I'm sure that uh, Carl would have talked about this again today, like um, from CIMEC. So we don't innovate. We don't do we we resources. Sometimes people say, oh, mining is different. It's uh, more traditional, more conservative. Where we Last time I checked in this country, when talk oil and, bias, oil and gas is a very more conservative province than anything else we do. Um, and then there was a research that EY did to try to ask a bunch of CEOs and COOs, what, you know, why is it that we're not innovating? Um, so people are saying, oh, we need to go back. Like that's what Deloitte report says again. We need to go back to the basics. We need to be operation excellent. But we can't just go back and make it happen because number one, we get different people, different realities. So we have to go back, but go back with innovative ways to do it. Um, we used to do innovation. I mean, I'm sure the first coup drum was a big deal. Uh, but, uh, and then we took it, then we made it into a, a remote scoop drum. That's great. You know, it's a continuous improvement. But we didn't do anything beyond that. There's still scoop drum anywhere I go. So it's like the question is, you know, what's the next scoop drum? And here is something that you always hear, but man, oh no, mining is different. People don't like innovation. Well, I've never seen a mine where people don't have smartphones. I've never seen a mine where people don't know what an iPad is. You go to even if you go to some, you know, remote places in Africa, they know what it is. So you can see what happened to the smartphone. It went from this to this. So this is the scoop drum, and we're probably like here, in my view. We haven't, f you know, we didn't think enough about what it's supposed to do. So when you're having your Blackberry, you know, especially the new ones, not the old ones. People have the old ones, I always wonder why. It's comfort, yes, but it's not innovative. Uh, so if mighty people develop phones, they'd be as big as this room. That's, uh, yeah, I agree. Yeah, and they'll weigh a lot, yeah. Made of gold. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we do innovation every time. Navigation systems. Uh, when I first came to Canada, I remember there was a navigation system. Every place I went, and I've been to too many of them in my view, I used to have to stop at the gas system by the map, okay? Because I don't like going in a place where I don't know what the name of the roads are. I used to do that. Today I don't. I went to the US not long ago, and I was like, oh, yeah, I don't need even to buy a map. I can use my phone. Uh, the GM uh, CEO was talking about the fact that his own kids do not believe in the navigation system that is coming with the car because it's like 4, 4K more. They just use their phone and it's faster and it's reliable because the towers are closer than the GPS now. So that's another thing. Your smart meter, um, you want to know how your power is going, you want to know things right away. Well, you do it. And then I'm not even talking about social media. People are curious, they want to share stuff. Don't you think your employees want to do the same? I'm pretty sure they want to do the same. I'm sure that if you have an operation somewhere in Zambia and you have an operation somewhere in Nevada, and it's easy to guess who that is, they may want to know what you're doing every day. They may want to know how you're doing your safety stuff. And you know what? There's platform for this. This is not even like rocket science. This is like stuff you, off the shelf technology. And I, I'm talking about retirement plan here because people plan stuff, okay? And uh, I'm not one of those yet, uh, but if I, <laughs> for most of us here that do RSPs, retirement, whatever, I'm pretty sure that if you want to know right now where that portfolio is, you can. I'm sure you can. If you can't, you should change your bank. But if you can do that, there's no reason why right now you can't check and see the actual status of your mining operation, because it's no different. Same thing. It's actually more complicated for your portfolio because it's uh, TSX in New York. They uh, go up and down, up and down, up and down. But you still know. Operation doesn't do that. So there's no reason why we cannot know the plan, see the actual, take action to change it. There's no reason. And that's why I want to talk about these. The technology is there. Uh, technology is enablement. Um, by the way, before they created the word technology, it used to just be called techniques. So when we moved out of the cave and we used to eat the raw meat, uh, that was like very basic. Then we created fire and then we start cooking it. 
That's a technology. That's a change in technology. Anthropology will tell you that's a technology change right there. Then we made metal. Um, that's another technology. Then we started building houses. Then we built sky skyscrapers. And now people want to go to the moon. These are all technologies. It's cheaper. It's moving. It's faster. And, um, you know, it's like, uh, it's like thinking that there's somebody today that is still trying to cook with, like, uh, you know, wood outside and whatever. It's the same, using the wrong technology for the current modern world. So technology exists. You need to understand the landscape. And if you don't, well, there are people that help. Like, uh, like Marcus says, that's what they do. They've, they'll map up what the technology is out there. And it may not be yours, but it may be for coming from somebody else. And the reason for that is that we want visibility. Some of it is sensory, you know, you want to see stuff. Uh, yeah, you, we get a report, a report is in a PDF or whatever it is, but we don't see it. We want to see stuff. Uh, CCTV cameras are cheap now, okay? It's not any more expensive than the little thing in your computer anymore. Like, like I remember webcam, when webcam came up first, was expensive, you know. Logitech was still a little company. Today, Oh, yeah, and you used to have to buy one and put it on top of the computer because there was no laptop yet, right? Like, there were, but it wasn't advanced. And, and I'm young, relatively. So I'm not even going to talk about people that are older than me. And, you know, people keep talking about some cards thing, and I still don't know what it is. That the way university, they used to write a code in the card, in the card, whatever. I have no idea what it is. And like I said... <laughs> That's, that's, that's what's different. So we want sensory. Sensory is cheap. We can do it. There's no reason why you can't have a, a camera on the ground, high-speed cameras or whatever you want, and see what's going on. There's no reason why you can't have it real time. If I can talk to my mom in Burkina on Skype, you can talk to your operator at your site wherever else you want. Analytics is another one. Uh, right now, when you... You log on, you want to see where your credit card is, for example, okay? And it just doesn't give you the, well, okay, here's where your credit card is. It can actually tell you all the stuff you bought the last 40, uh, 48 hours and whatever. These are analytics. It's not just the data. The data itself is what I call CSI. You're just looking at something that is dead. What you want is insight. So data has to tell you, oh, here's what's going on. And if you're really good, the data may be able to tell you, here's all the optionality of what you can do. Just like that little uh, voice in, uh, in your GPS say that if you miss the road, it says recalculating, and it tells you the next road you can take. Processes. People want to know the processes. Um, especially today, we, you know, we have uh, g gender gaps, cultural gaps, age gaps. You have to make the processes known to everybody. You can't just have it in your head anymore. It has to be understood. It has to be simplified and standardized. Interaction. People want to interact. They want to know the facts. They want to, so this is all things that we do day in, day out in our own lives. And there's no reason why we can't do it in mining. Um, you know, I'll talk about system and outcomes later. Okay, I told you to be ready. Some of the stiff are uh, still learning. In a year, it'll be better. <laughs> <laughs> See? And I've learned it last night. There we go. Yeah. Now I'm going to talk about diapers, razors, and ingots. So I, I'll pick two technologies or, or practices that I know of that have success. And here's how I approach it. Until, um, so there was a paper two years ago in the Harvard Business Review about how you structure your succession planning and your executive team. So people that make decisions, not just to see everybody that make decisions. How you structure it in a normal organization to make sure that you're still relevant. And I remember that they were saying that 25% of people have to be, you know, in their 40s and up. And then the 50% have to be between 30 and 40 because they're, the, you know, basically the people with the steam. And then 25% will be the young guys that I have no idea why we're doing the way we do things. So what I did is try to look at the industry and say, OK, what is easier to do? Because maybe for the next 15, 20 years, 
we can have those 25% that are risk averse, which makes a lot of sense. There's an economic theory about hyperbolic discounting that says that the closer you are to you know, being retired or, or whatever passed away, the less risky you're supposed to behave. That's an economist thing. So they're not going to make the big changes. Some of them will because, you know, they're still crazy people. But how do we do some of the simple stuff that people will feel comfortable that, okay, yeah, this is done already. You know, we can just do it. It's going to work. I'm not talking about open innovation. I'm not talking about changing the game. I'm talking about things that you can just pull together and say, yeah, this is okay. You know, I'm, talking about, I'm not talking about buying uh, <coughs> iPhone 6. I'm talking about buying iPhone 3. That everybody knows, oh, this one works. Don't sell it anymore. Yeah, probably. See? That's mining. It's late. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to talk to you guys about Procter & Gamble. I know you mentioned it. Procter & Gamble created something called reliability technology. The name is misleading, but I'll talk to you about it. Okay, this is where I'm going to get in trouble now. We can do it? Yes. So for many years, as you see, they developed a bunch of systems. And they were lucky. So this is why my mining, thing, mining background mixes with this. Because I worked in uranium for a time. So the Los Alamos lab in the US had capacity, like calculation capacity, basically computer capacity. And, um, and they wanted to do stuff. So they, they approached Procter and said, hey, do you get things that we can help you with. And Procter & started working with them on analytics. What we call today analytics, they figured this out a long time ago. And how they did it is they started looking at all the system and optimizing the manufacturing system. And they also looked at the people behavior. They, they looked at the technology, all the key elements to make sure that when you go buy the diaper, it's still the same diaper. If you buy the box of diaper, the failure rate is really low, if not inexistent. If you buy a razor, because you don't think about that, but when you buy a razor, you're expecting there's the same one like before. Well, because there's a whole lot of system in it, and Procter & Gamble calls it reliability technology. So what it did is, you know, integrated approach, processes system-based, and using analytics, fixing the mistake as they go, yeah, this didn't make like the Toyota system, whatever, because Toyota system is something else. But this is really intrinsically how you produce something with controls and a lot of it with no less mistakes. I think mining guys want to have that. That's what I believe. And um, okay, this is where they, I have to talk about EY. I didn't really want to, as you know, they took the logos out. Basically, um, EY and Procter & Gamble were working to, EY is more like risk averse. EY will come and tell you why you shouldn't do something because it's risky. Um, <laughs> but they also will tell you, well, but here's this thing you can do and it's low risk. So EY and Procter & Gamble worked together on this implementation piece. And now EY bought uh, like a patent from Procter & Gamble to go and implement in every other things. And of course, we tried it in mining. Um, and, I'll, and I'll talk about that. So that's, that's what the pattern is. But it's only, it's going to expire in seven years. <laughs> so if you have money, get ready. In seven years, you can go get your own. Um, so here's the methodology. We do that a lot. Downtown analysis, we get a junior guy, sits there, takes all the mechanical data, and sits there and try to tell you all what's going on. Uh, Pareto is something that anybody <laughs> in Lean Six Sigma like to talk about. But the question that Procter & Gamble tried to address is the competing causes. What created what, and it made it co all complicated. Uh, one of the guys like to take an example of him and his family stopping at a restaurant because one of the kids wants to go to the bathroom. They stop at the restaurant, it's supposed to take five minutes. The kids can't go in the bathroom alone, so they go with the mom. And then the other kids, when they walk in, the mom says, oh yeah, I needed to buy a lipstick. So she buys a lipstick, but there's a kid that wants to buy, I don't know, a cookie. Then they're trying to buy a cookie and a lipstick. And suddenly, one of the kids wants to go to the washroom too. So he goes to the washroom, comes back. They're 15 minutes late, back in the car. What happened? It's a bunch of things that happen. And what the reliability, te the reliability technology try to do is understand what created it first, and then what happened later, and go back and fix what created it first. So maybe it should have been that, OK, we should have just said, 
every 100 kilometers will stop for 15 minutes because then we reduce the risk. And that's the approach that the Revit technology is taking. So it looks at all those pillars. So who is leading? Sometimes it's the style, like you're saying. You got to make sure it's the right style of person leading. Uh, how the organization works. Uh, maintenance. Maintenance is not just mechanical. How do we maintain stuff so that they stay at a productive level? And then you go on the processes, the qualities, and everything. And you can read it later and ask me a question if you want. And others did implement the same system, believe it or not. So Gerald Mills, they implemented it, and they made 15 billion. Uh, I mean, this is where they're actually saving the money, increasing mean time between failure, decreasing number of stops. I mean, who doesn't want to decrease the number of stops of trucks? And you know, how do you design your, your haulage ramp so that you don't even have the survey you're driving on the same one? If stops is the big deal, how do you do that? But first, you got to know that that's a problem. So that's where you do the mapping, and I'll talk about that later. And so that's, that's what it is. It's a set of tools. They're very simple, and they help you figure out what's going on. Here's the test we did. Went to one of the iron ore miners, and we said, hey, there's this thing from Procter & Gamble. What do you think? And I'll, oh, you know, <laughs> like you expect. We don't really like these new things. It's too complicated. Well, OK. We can pilot it somewhere. Uh, oh, how come? Well, okay, go to the crusher. You know very well, crusher is that is where you have the least people. So they're going somewhere where normally we're not supposed to have any disruption. And this is how the crusher is working. You can see that there's peaks and froth, and we're like, okay, what's going on here? Here they're running at a fix, you know, for 12,500 ton, and then they're running it reduced. And the question is, what happened? Well, Here's the competing cause analysis. You can see all day. Somebody's waiting for something. The convey is not working. The crashing is not working. Uh, there's a stockyard problem. There's a lump problem, reclaiming problem, screening problem. And then you start analyzing, OK, what drives what? And how do you optimize? Well, to optimize, it's not simple. It's going to take time. So you got to take piece by piece. And uh, I think here, I mean, I've pulled this up so you can see it. Basically, the, your reliability is going to be this one. How you go from having 60% reliability to 90%. That's this window. And then the mean time between failures is like you want, you don't, you want the system not to be down most of the time. So you got to work at each phase and fix your competing cause as you go. Of course, it means that your unplanned losses will go down. And you may even be able to optimize your planned losses. Here's what was discovered. And this is why I can't tell you who it is. Hopefully, it's not written anywhere. <laughs> we discovered that, as typical, they were going for push it harder. We need more throughput. Yet, because of the competing factors and the reliability problems they have, what they should do is go back a little bit, and then they can run it longer without interruption. And that's the kind of solution that helps people understand. Uh, of course, we had numbers here for millions, but we're not going to talk about it. All I can tell you is like in one month, they were able to pay back the investment for the piloting. So that's for that one. <coughs> now I'm going to talk about Rockets, Credit Card, and Mines. It's, it's more fun. But same thing. Nothing is new. We're just borrowing. And when we borrow, we just change the labels and call it mining. That's all we do. Um, <laughs> That, no, I'm really, really on the simplistic side. I'm not talking about crazy innovation with big money. I'm talking about just look around. Whatever you're doing yourself, do the same. Think about this. Integrated operation centers. An integrated operation center is like yourself. Okay? You're using technology. You have habits. That's your processes. And you interact with people. How do you make this all work? This is the life of a human. That's what it is. So how do you turn the mind into something that is kind of a living thing? You all know this one. This is very old. 1969, people went to the moon. They built the command center. That's NASA. 1969, that's a long time ago. So this is how, how old the technology is. Probably older than that. This is a remote operation center, basic. People sit here, talk to people on the moon. And they can see them. And they can do stuff. 
And, and we even managed to get an arm in the, at the space station that we can maneuver from the ground. And that's like a long time ago already, like it's more than 10 years, I'm sure. It's simple, it's cheaper today, so there's no reason why we can't do it. Second one, how I many of you have seen uh, fraud alert from Visa? They'll call you and say, hey, uh, we noticed that your card is being used in uh, Chile, but uh, your, they're not going to tell you that, but I can tell you that they know your phone. But we think that you're located in Toronto. Well, because they know your phone, they track you. Don't think that the companies don't track people, they track people. It's, it's, uh, it's unclear if it's illegal. I'm sure it's illegal, but it's unclear enough that they can track you. How do they do that? They have an operations center, and each of the visa cards on the planet, they can track it. This is more complicated than tracking buckets of oil that look the same. And they can track your habits. Uh, one of our guys in the office, um, Amex, called him, hey, we noticed you bought uh, a big uh, Canon camera, and you never bought a camera since you have the Amex. What's going on? Uh, oh, it's not him. Somebody else is doing it. So they can even track your habits, your history. So that's, each of the credit cards have a center like that, and they can see what's going on. This one is, uh, this is, uh, um, I put this because I like uh, Warren Buffett. Uh, sorry if some of you don't like him, but I like Warren Buffett. And he invests money in, uh, in the BNSF. This is how BNSF tracked the rail across the Americas. And CN has one, <coughs> I didn't get a picture, but CN also has one, where the track, where the, trail, where the rail is, and they can take action, and uh, hopefully it's gonna save us down the road when we start curling oil all over the country. So it's, there's a safety piece in it. And this one is, uh, it's how they maneuver the, the Air Canada planes. Uh, I think it's just the Americas, and I think this is in uh, it's Mississauga or somewhere west of Toronto, and it's new. The reason I put it here, they opened it last year, I think, so it's new. And this is how they do operation of the plane and talk to the pilot and change the schedule and whatever they need to do. No, this was before they opened it. I took this picture from Global Mail. <laughs> yes, it's not working there. Yeah, that's a good point. So overall, what is an operation center? Well, it's a place where you put people together that's supposed to be closer to each other and you reduce the boundaries. So <clears throat> you have the operation people. To have all the operation people basically means you have to have automation in place. You have to have uh, some kind of direct communication between you and the equipment. You have the planners, you have the schedulers, you have the maintenance people. Uh, so suddenly, if you're sitting there and you can see on the screen that somebody is moving a truck a different place and you're the planner and you know that's not in the plan, you can just call and say, hey, what's going on? And, then, oh, and they all have webcams and, and uh, speaker phones, everything they can have. <coughs> the consumer market has it. This is the Walmart one. Believe it or not, Walmart has one. So if Walmart has one, we should have one because they're cheap, so we should be cheaper. Um, and then oil and gas, of course, has one. Uh, Statoil is one of, you know, has a big one. Shell has a big one. They call it different names. Basically, that's the same thing. And this year is like, it's to show you, mining has one. Uh, this is um, a mosaic in Florida. And, uh, and I think this is really into Yeah, it's written there. There is benefits to it. So BHP generated positive NPV in order hundreds of millions. Actually, not in America, but I can't tell you, unfortunately. Um, I actually went there and we were trying to replicate the same thing for BHP products. I can't tell you the number, but it's, it's a lot. Of, it pays back quickly and you discover things you didn't know. Like you said, like I said, it's like my crazy thing. I'm discovering as I go and I'm like, oh, okay, this can do more things than I thought. Uh, Codelco has one uh, that they're working on with uh, Honeywell. Um, this is like big operation all over the place. How do you make it together? And of course, Rio Tinto was the first to do it in, in uh, in Australia. I know Valley has one too for the ports. What's the benefit? Well, safety thing. Number one, you get people out of the site. You automate what you can. One of the biggest, one of the compelling reasons for, and you, you, you're talking about the big trucks, compelling reason for automation or autonomy is really that no matter which human you have, unless they're really on, under influence, if you put them in those uh, 797 
Caterpillar trucks and you ask them to drive by each other a meter apart, I don't think they'll do it. So what do you do? You build a road track that is three times the width of the truck. So you get a 30 meter wide road all over the pit because you want to make sure they can pass each other and feel comfortable. If you go autonomy, the truck doesn't have an emotion anymore, so he can drive a meter apart and still be fine. This is what kind of savings we're talking about. And this is why it's difficult for mining engineers because they have to think through it. And then they have to go back and design something that does that instead. <coughs> Relocation and stuff is a big deal. Even when we pay people a lot of money to be expat or, or go remote, it pays a lot of money. I did, uh, did rotations a lot. Even when you do that, they're still going to leave you. Case in point, I'm here. <laughs> so how do you make sure you can tap into resources that are in the city and they're comfortable, they're doing the work you and you actually end up paying less? Or you put in the city, put in the metropolitan, usually in the big city, uh, for Rio Tinto and and um, and Valley and Codelco and BHP, it's all in cities. Rio Tinto and uh, BHP are in Perth, Valley is in Rio and uh, Codelco is in Santiago. So suddenly you can get the best engineers, the best planners, best schedulers, and they're working together and they can see the site. It also creates, you know, um, increased coordination. It's not a different department. The guys are actually on the same floor. You got mirrors just separating them like glass mirrors, but they can see what they're doing. They can have a quick meeting. They can make a decision. They don't wait for a report. The plan doesn't wait for a report to know what's going on. He can see it on the screen what's going on. And the reason that I actually volunteered to talk today was because of this big screen over there. And I thought that it was what the Australian call a uh, production, uh, it's called a PVT, it's for production value something, I don't remember the T, it's a technology, I think it is. So basically they have big screens all over the office and it shows what's going on at site. And the uh, latest, the, because the system have, uh, dif have different uh, response rate. So the, the, the latest one is 20 minutes. So every 20 minutes, the picture you see on the screen is what's going on from the site all the way to the port. They can see if a boat is late, so they can slow down the train, reducing the energy consumption. They can see if somebody's broken down, they can swing it. And suddenly, like you can get the scheduler changing it, talking to the planner, and there's a site. And, and the next level of it is to have the traders in the room. I think that's going to be messy, personally. <laughs> but to have traders in the room, uh, how many times would you hear marketing saying, hey, you know, how come you're not producing this? Well, there's no how come anymore. He can see why it's not being produced. So there's a lot of benefit to it, and, uh, and it's quite easy to implement. So this is what it's after. Vision, alignment, people know what they're doing together. Uh, standardization, you need to make sure all the processes are the same. You don't have one ship doing something, a second one doing something else. Uh, human factors is the comfort. Um, I can tell there's a lot of research in it. I was, just, I was actually surprised to read about that. But it's basically, um, and the good news is I was surprised, but I was happy about it. Did you guys know that the best temperature under which a human operates is 23 degrees Celsius? There's a bunch of uh, innovators or R&D people that studied that. So the operating center has to have 23 degrees Celsius. Now, in here we would have just put a heat up. In Australia it's a big deal because it's too hot, so I gotta cool it down. So get all kinds of cooling system and then there's uh, noise levels you have to respect. And I wish my house had the same. Because <laughs> when that fan goes, you don't want the guy to be like, oh my God, the air conditioning is going. And so there's noise levels, so that, and the technology exists. There's lighting, you know, how much light can they come in, what the screen look like. There's even the number of, the optimum number of screen that the human mind can optimally operate. And I can tell you the number, it's eight. And the eight is really for the specialized, okay? The eight screen is for the train operators that can do multiple things at, at once. For mining engineers, it's two. Don't ask me. <laughs> <laughs> but it was two. And then the operators have six. And in that screen, there's, you know, you have your CCTV going and you, and, you know, you have your, your planning numbers and then you have what he can maneuver. Another thing I discovered that I found was um, 
was fascinating is that our brain doesn't like multiple lights. It's funny that the dense color is completely the opposite, but our brains don't like multiple lights. So there's what they call um, abnormal situation management. It's a whole study on its own. So that says, uh, okay, what you should show on the screen is everything grayed out, only abnormal situation get pop red. So guess what, when you see a PVT in, in Australia, it's grayed out and anything that has a problem is red. It's not red, green, blue, everywhere, no, it's, no, 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 it's grayed out. And that's, that's uh, there's a lot of studies on that. That's what human factors are. And then there's the seat. Uh, if you're gonna sit more than six hours, then you need like a, a elevating, and like a f flexible table that goes up and down, a guy can stand up and do that. Um, you don't want the guy to be disconnected from the system, so he has to have um, basically uh, his uh, headset when he's going to the bathroom and coming back, so he's always connected. Uh, next of course, will be to buy the Google glasses and add it to it, but that's, that's coming. That's where the technology can still be leveraged. So that's from now on. Um, this is a BHP slide, you'll see it in everything they do. It's basically what's the benefit start slow, you go live, and then it goes crazy because suddenly you, you discover many other things you didn't know about. Uh, for example, they discovered that uh, there was this guy, he's an operator, and um, every 11.59 at night, he has to go put a switch back on. Now, nobody knows about that, he just figured out on his own because apparently the switch was designed to shut off before midnight, so it, it's a clocked thing. So it doesn't know zero, zero. So it shuts off, and then he goes and puts it on. How he used to do it, he has an iPhone, and that's where technology mixes weirdly with mining, and he'll set up his iPhone to ring at 11.59, and he goes and does it. When they put the guys together in the IROC in, in, in Australia, one of the operators noticed that there's this technician that 11.59 always going to the same place. So he asked the guys, what is the guy doing every time at this time? He said, oh, no, because there's a switch there and, uh, you know, he needs to do that every day at 11.59. They're like, but how come we never fixed it? And then they pulled the group together, and what they needed to do is just use a different switch that doesn't clock with, uh, that doesn't, like, zero, zero. So these are the benefits you can never really figure out if you still operate in silos. And um, here's, I've put this last because I've been there. This is the PHP Billiton one. And um, of course, you get this guy has a lot of screen, but he's not actually using, he only uses this. This is, that's it. So that's the, that's the IROC, and this is a train operator. It's a nice place. You can see the sailing. Like I said, when the fan comes on, it's no noise. It's just quiet. You know, it's all existing technology, nothing crazy. And this is usually what it takes to build one. I like to put it up there because it's not that complicated. Uh, BHP actually built this over one year. And then it took them six months to run it. And then they said, oh, we opened it. But I was visiting it before they made it official. So I, and these are the aspects it looks at. looks at people, how people work together. It looks at processes. There's all kind of theory about it. And uh, that we're basically borrowing from NASA, the Army, uh, all the transportation guys. And it's, like I said, it's straightforward. So here's now my position about this. You got to know your processes. Before you even create a vision, you got to know your processes. Um, I know companies that make a lot of money just mapping processes, showing people what the job is. So you just put a kid and then the kid writes down, okay, here's what the process is, here's what's going. There are people that just do that. Now, there's beyond processes, your value stream, you know. Um, when I hit process number five in the mill, how much value did I create it on the ore that I took from the ground? It's simple calculation you can get to, and uh, sometimes you don't have the people to do it, but consultant will do it for you. And it's, it allows you to make the decision on where you're actually gonna increase your, your value. The other thing I believe in is you have to re-examine your vision. And like I said, it's hard. 
it's hard. You got to jump from the pond into a new one where nobody's there to tell you how it's going and you may be alone. But you know what? You become a leader. Is it risky? Yeah. And that's why you pay firms like uh, all the big fours to run the risk assessment and tell you, okay, here's the risk and here's how you're going to do to mitigate it. But I think this is what mining needs to do. Simplification is a big deal. Uh, we still, you know, we inherit processes that we don't question. And um, I will challenge you today to not do what you usually do when you leave the office, and I don't know what you do. But just, <laughs> just don't do that. Do something else and try to see. Take a different road just to see what's different. You may discover stuff. I get in trouble doing that, by the way, but I do it anyway. Uh, like today, <laughs> it may be crazy. So, Innovation is not a big concept. It's really what we do every day. If you always want your coffee to sit on one side, try to put it on the other side and see what the hell is going to do. Just, just to see. It may not do anything, then you keep doing what you do, but at least test. Test your habit. And then ask around. You can never do that on your own. You got to ask around. You got to ask university people how they're doing things. Of course, you got to be careful because they may not care as much uh, but you know you gotta put in place boundaries to help you create value quick enough or at least create some kind of common ground you can ask consultants um, mining doesn't like consultants especially uh, consultants that are not engineering consultants the whole thing is not engineering if the whole thing was engineering we would have solved it it is not engineering engineering will help you design a new system but you gotta just ask holistically, what am I gonna do different? What if I don't wanna do water? I was at a presentation last time with Jim Goins where he was talking about the TCM method, where they're gonna basically bypass all the roasters and just you know, use less cyanide or not use cyanide at all. That's the question, why are we using cyanide? Oh yeah, because we, we always use cyanide, but yeah, but why are we using it? So ask around, ask other people how they do things. And then this is the key piece where we fail. All the big innovation projects are just like capital projects. Sometimes we think it's an IT project and we let an IT company do it. No, it's a capital project. You gotta do your stage gating, you gotta do your pre-fees, fees thing. You gotta make sure you have risk controls in place. Uh, you can't leave it to somebody, you can't leave it to a third party. If you do, you're gonna regret it. You gotta have to make sure that most of the knowledge is captured by your people. You can't just outsource the whole thing to somebody external, unless it's commodity. If it's commodity, it's a different story. You know, don't try to build a new database when you can just get a kid to do it quicker for you. Don't try to create a data center where people have it cheap for you. Don't try to create a mobility system where you don't need one. But if you want to change the way you do business, uh, you may want to have your own people at least running the PMO, knowing what's going on. Because once the consultants are gone, you need to be able to fix it. Just like when you build your mind. You can't just let them build it. Well, you could try it, but so far we know it's wrong. It doesn't work well. That's it. And yes, Brazy can do some stuff. <laughs> Any questions? Comments. Do a little experiment. If you, if you take your watch on, let's say, your left hand, and just put it on your right hand, I bet you within like 10 minutes it'll drive you crazy. <laughs> <laughs> just try some do different, simple like that. And it's yeah, I'm gonna do it and see. And if you, well, you're not that, you're not that young because young people don't have watches. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. I joined your presentation. Element to solve some innovation. One element I take offense to is because I don't think it's innovative. Every presentation I listen to on innovation in mining, they all make the same comment. They say mining is way out here behind innovation. Uh -huh. They're not doing these things. I think, in first place, I think this is wrong. Mining is not lagging continuously. So that's, that's a factual, uh -huh. that's my opinion. Second thing, we are giving the wrong message in your presentation 
It's an example of some innovative things done in mining, yeah. as in the center in Perth and so forth. Yeah. So that's, I don't know if you want to. Yeah, no, I'd like to answer that because uh, the first thing I showed was, I wasn't talking about us, I was talking about mining innovation, I was talking about the type of people we are. Not, not if mining innovates or mining innovates, we know that. But the type of people we are, we are more on the blue ones, so it takes us forever to innovate. If we think about uh, the IROC, for example, in Perth, or, or we think about Sam Walsh, okay? These are people, Sam Walsh came from, uh, from uh, oil and gas, okay? So we can't really call him that he's a mining guy. So that's where he brought the technology from to do that. If you think about Marius Kloppers, Marius came from consulting. He didn't go from, like, yeah, he's a materials engineer, whatever, but he never really worked in a mine. He went to McKinsey, then he went, to, he went into BHP in marketing, and ended up running the company. That's who does it. There is uh, Rob himself. If he came from mining, I doubt that he'll do what he did. He might have, because this could be a personality thing, but most of the guys that actually come with a change, if we even think about Valley, the, I don't remember the Italian name there, but he wasn't a mining guy. So that's what I'm trying to say is that the personalities of the people that are running the show to do the changes may not be the ones that have the early adopters for things. Does mining do it? Yes. But all the cases I show are innovation stuff. But it doesn't come natural, and uh, in Canada, when you think about the guys that are running the show in operations, if they're really mining guys, you will have a hard time selling some of those concepts. Because that's what I've noticed. It doesn't mean mining as a whole is lagging. It means that if we, when we get the right leadership, we can go fast. So you're qualifying your skills. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah, next time you go, next time you go to a mine, ask yourself why they keep writing by hand. Why, ask yourself why there's too many papers for time and attendance and things like that. Anytime I walk into the building, the security knows I've passed the building. Uh, how come we can't have the same swiping thing there? That's my question. Why are they writing in paper? They have iPads. Why are they writing, you know, the iPad, what I like about iPad is, and, and there's a reason why all grammars are using it, it's because you just touch button. That's why the kids love it. There's no reason why, you know, when the guy is about to write a note on something, there's no reason why he couldn't pull up the iPad and just, even if he has big fingers because there's no, you know, we know what it is, then just pinched up. It could be icons, he's just typing. He doesn't even need to type anything, he just touch. But we, 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 we lag him on that. But I'll give a great example. I was in a meeting and I don't usually take paper and pen with me anywhere. And I start in a meeting and I start going like this. So many people have come forward and asked me, you're so rude, why are you on your phone all the time? And I just show them all the notes that I've taken for myself. So it, it is a lot of it with perception yes. as well. Yeah, there is. Because other people's habits, because of the way we have been structured to think about something as well. So it's breaking a lot of those barriers as well. But yeah. Sometimes you need to be a person that needs to be reprimanded for other people to think that that person is not just sitting there talking to his uh, girlfriend. Or yeah, I actually thought about that doing this in Prezi. Uh, I would talk to Nathan before this presentation about, you know, can I put a little uh, EY logo on it? Or he's like, yeah, you can do that. You know, you're going to spend some time doing it anyway. But now when I went to Prezi, uh, we don't have a policy about Prezi. So I can't put an EY logo on this thing? <laughs> because I'll be reprimanded. Like, I, I know that for sure. It's like, oh, what the hell is wrong with you? So, <laughs> so I agree. There's, there's some barriers and uh, sometimes you get punished. Yeah, I agree. You know, what did you like about crazy now that you've used it once? It, it forces you to think for crazy, which is new. It makes you realize that there's no reason why it should be slides. And sequential. It's sequential, you know, and you can move around. Yeah. I can move back to something else, and you can just have one picture. Um, I haven't discovered all the stuff in it. Like I said, it's only started yesterday at 9 p.m. Uh, but, <laughs> but I'll get there. Um, 
We can do a special crazy presentation in a year, <laughs> like I said. But yeah, that's that's what I like about it. It's uh, it's cloud based. Um, so I was worried about venturing too much out in my innovative thing uh, and coming with my phone and trying to hook it up with the computer. But it's really that I didn't need to bring the laptop. Really, it's cloud based. It's anywhere I go, and I can't lose it because um, today we have internet everywhere. But you know, in the past, it would have been a different story. But sometimes, you know, think about it, infrastructure that helps you carry it around. So and you can pleased? share it. Are you pleased with Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I love it. I, I think I learn more about it and be better at it and maybe do a competition with son. your son. <laughs> <laughs> what would it cost to do a system like you were proposing? Um, we do business cases. I can... If I'm not going to give you a name, I can give you the numbers. So five mines in the same area, but remote, 15 kilometers away. You got to do upgrade to your fiber optics and things got these little details. Um, 140 million payback, uh, less than one year. Uh, you do increase of production by 1%. Back when iron ore was... Uh, you know, hundred dollars. Even even if it was less, hundred dollars, one percent on uh, twenty-five million ton, you can get your money back quickly. Uh, same thing with uh, another project I was PM on, where it was completely green. If you greenfield is even fantastic, you come in, you decide, okay, I want all these people to be in the same place. That's now with size. You know, like what costs money is the technology. But the technology is really how many people you have in the room and how many desktop and what are they supposed to connect with. That one was like, uh, I think it was something like uh, 50 million. It was even cheaper because it was new. So there was no legacy system. They were buying stuff from scratch, 50 million. And we expected the payout to be immediate because, because they were starting a process that was already cleaned up. Um, I, I know that in general the rate of return on it within a year is uh, one to two percent when you you know factor in all the stuff you can think about. Now there's uh, subgroups to it. I, I didn't want to venture into that. This is I'm passionate about this by the way. The subgroups to it where you can decide okay I'm going to do maintenance ex excellence first. So I'm going to put my because maintenance is my problem. So I'm going to put my maintenance guys in one room with the with the procurement guys to make sure that there's no you know, delays and whatever. You can start with that. You can just say, okay, I'm going to create the system. I'm not going to do an operation center. Some cases it doesn't work because if you do operation center and you hire people here, then you don't have people in whatever you have your mind, you may have some CSR problem. So I'm not going to do operation center, but I'm going to create a center within the mine where people sit there and not in the pit. I went to a pit of one of the biggest producers in the country here, and I was surprised that the dispatcher was sitting on top of the pit, okay? <laughs> With all the screens, it looks like a robot operation. He can talk to the drivers and everything. He was sitting on top of the pit. He had all the cameras, but he was sitting there. And then the plants were sitting in a different building. And then the mill guy had, I think he had like 12 screens. And he was using advanced app applications too. And I asked him, how come they're sitting in different places? Oh, you know, you know, the guy wants to sit at the pit because he can see it. I said, why do you need to sit? You get cameras, you think cameras are lying to you? <laughs> why do you need to sit? And, and, and he also has a GPS technology, so it shows the truck and where the truck is. He doesn't really need to, he didn't, he didn't even need a, a CCTV to tell the truth. But it's paradigms, okay? Uh, I know many people that never, never believe in the backup camera. If you're one of those, this is the kind of situation it is. If there's a backup camera and the camera is good and showing the back, you're not supposed to put your hand and try to look in the back when you're driving your car. It's just like, a, you know, what are you talking about? It's a backup camera. It probably sees better than your eyes. <laughs> but that, these are the things. So you can, you can start by consolidating guys in the room. That's going to cost nothing. You may have to upgrade your technology. And then you can have the information flow. Information flow is really what people care about. It's really, I want to know what's going on and make a decision. That's really where the value is. So, I don't know. He's a director for planning, goes in the room and sees that they're off 
for the past six hours by 20%, calls him and say, what's going on? I see you off. That's decision making. He's not going to wait for end of the day for a report. And he's also going to see what, how they're doing it as they go. Because sometimes we average. Humans average a lot. Average is bad. Because average doesn't tell you what the problem is. It doesn't tell you that they did nothing, and then the last six <laughs> hours they did everything. Because if that's what they did, well, you held them accountable and say, well, apparently you can do everything in six hours, so we're going to double production. That's, that's the kind of questions that I think I will ask people. Do you see financial reporting on the same time as operations reporting? Yes, because the value stream mapping links everything. So you can see both. You can see how much they're buying stuff. Uh, if you have a strong ERP, the ERP will actually have a... Um, I, didn't, I don't have a picture for that, but I'll tell you something else. The ERP will actually have how much they're spending. Every PO that goes out, you can actually have a screen for just how, they, how they're doing with budget. You can do that. Um, you can link your consumption to your cost. You can see that too. You can, um, I went to, uh, I went to uh, Hangzhou in China to visit Alibaba campus. It's something that if you get an opportunity to do, you should do because uh, that was in 2011. And we were shocked. Uh, these are, you know, there's a lot of technology guys this is from, from Oxford. And we were shocked But what it was. There was a big wall. It's like double. So it's this width, but double in height, showing China and showing the map of the world and showing how many people are processing things through Alibaba. Like a, like a clock, it counts. And it, it shows where the processing is from. It says if it's doing banking, if they're paying a bill, or if they basically just getting a, a loan. It shows, it tabulates. It shows people that are creating Alibaba accounts. Every time somebody creates Alibaba, it pops up. And it's live. And it got all kinds of metrics. It looks like the stock exchange, except that it's just for Alibaba internal use. And they have it all cloud-based. Now, you'll say, yeah, you know, in China, cloud is more secure, whatever you want. But I think cloud is secure depending on which provider you use anyway. And ultimately, it doesn't matter much. But, but that's, that's what Alibaba used to do. And that was before they went public this year. And I remember seeing that. I remember thinking, I wonder if Google doing that, but we can't see it. But that's, that's what they did. And they replicated. This is why stealing is not bad. Stealing means borrowing. If you go to Alibaba's campus, it looks like Google campus. They built it the same way. Really, really nice, young people. Uh, they have their own leisure. So there's like a bunch of ping pong tables. Uh, of course, there's a lot of charming and Chinese food in their restaurant. And, but it's, it's the same. I was like, wow. And it's in Hangzhou. Most of us don't need, even know where that is. But it was the same. But what they did different is that they created visibility. Because Mr. Mars, the column, is crazy about visibility. He wants to know how it's going. He wants to know right at the spot how it's going. And we can do it. I, I, think, I think it's all about business case. I think it's, about, it's all about making sure you can pay yourself back and making sure you have a visionary person that says, OK, here's what the future is going to be.